uh, to uh, to your immediate left, we have uh, Heidi Gantwork, and uh, Heidi represents a very very interesting uh, organization called Viewpoint Learning. And uh, Viewpoint Learning, and I, she's going to explain a lot more about this uh, to you in just a second here, uh, provides uh, opportunities and new mechanisms uh, to dialogue uh, about the subject uh, of today, uh, utilizing a whole variety of interesting uh, tools uh, and techniques. And then um, we have Martin Cerna. And uh, Martin, wave to the folks over there. Martin. Uh, is one of the co-founders of an organization that I know he wants to tell you uh, something about, which is called Concerned Youth of America. And this is essentially a grassroots organization, the purpose of which uh, is to raise people's understanding, to in increase people's uh, consciousness uh, of the issues that we have been uh, talking about uh, all day. Um, and then uh, we have David Burstein. And I uh, got to know David uh, a little bit uh, last year. Uh, actually, uh, fortunate enough to know his, uh, his dad quite well uh, as well. Uh, but David is absolutely unique. He's also a uh, filmmaker. And uh, he did a movie back in 08 that involved interviews with uh, dozens and dozens of leading policymakers uh, about the political issues that surrounded uh, the 08 elections. And, of course, one of those issues was uh, fiscal uh, responsibility. Uh, and David uh, has a lot to, uh, to talk to you about. And uh, then we have Patrick Creedon. And uh, we, we were able to uh, cajole Patrick to uh, join us on the, on the panel. Uh, Patrick is the filmmaker that actually made IOUSA, that of uh, course we've been referring to, uh, and is busy even as we speak today uh, filming the sequel, uh, which as I understand it is going to be called IOUSA uh, Solutions and will uh, coincide, uh, as David Walker was suggesting, with the release of his, uh, of his new book. And then to kind of keep the discussion uh, rolling along, um, we have a uh, student panel that are going to be uh, reactors to uh, what they hear from the uh, panelists to kind of get the ball rolling, and then we'll have hopefully uh, plenty of opportunity for lots of you folks uh, to ask some questions of the uh, of the panel. So just very, very uh, briefly, uh, we have a, a, a recent uh, graduate of the program and uh, – uh, a gentleman that is very much on the cutting edge of uh, if there are going to be any jobs in the future. Uh, some of them uh, involve uh, technology development, uh, and that's Eric Butts, uh, who just recently received his, uh, his master's degree in uh, public policy. We have a couple of uh, undergraduate students in uh, public policy. Uh, right here at DU, representing uh, the university, Jennifer Armstrong, and Brooke Depp and Bush are both uh, going to be on our uh, panel. Uh, and then we have three master's degree candidates. We give both master's and uh, undergraduate degrees in public policy here at DU. Uh, and that's Emma Dubach Donahue, uh, Gabby Reed, and Brian Stofka. So these folks down here in front will uh, be keeping us on the uh, path uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is truly straight and narrow. Um, I will. Uh, exit my moderator function here by just holding up. We didn't make a, a slide of it, but this is uh, last week's uh, business week. Uh, for those of you that are still reading magazines or aware of these sorts of things, the cover says the lost generation. And uh, what this article talks about in a massively circulated, widely read uh, business publication uh, is that there are doubts and uncertainties, as I know many of you feel, about the role that your generation is going to uh, be able to, to play in the economy of the future. And the reason for that is, of course, uh, we need to invent the economy of the future. And there are an awful lot of doubts about how well, as David Walker was referring to and many of the panelists this morning, a lot of doubts about uh, how well we're doing that. Uh, so I'm going to turn the uh, microphone over to uh, Heidi Gantwick, Gantwick, and uh, welcome Heidi. 
and uh, we'll have a great afternoon. Thank you. So first, a disclaimer, I am not a budget expert, nor do I play one on TV. Um, Viewpoint Learning is an organization that is devoted to civic engagement, to engaging the public, to engaging leaders in discussion of difficult, value-laden policy issues, issues where worldviews come into play, where we have been stuck in sort of incremental change, and where polls and focus groups and our typical methods of figuring out where the public is and what they think are not moving us forward, where the public really doesn't have an authentic voice at the table. So in any given month, I might be working on health care reform, the federal debt, U.S. Muslim relations, land use, and new airports. So all the easy problems right, to solve. Um, what I'm going to talk about, for the past four years, we've been working with the Concord Coalition around America's fiscal future. And we have conducted dialogues around the United States, around um, different options, different potential approaches to resolving some of the questions around our fiscal future. And our goal is to identify where the public is, where the public is willing to go, given the time, the structure right, and, and the guidance to, to move on these issues, what sort of solutions they're willing to support and what trade-offs they're willing to accept once they've had a chance to work through these complex questions. Ideally, what this does is lay out a roadmap for leaders who now have nothing but polls and focus groups to respond to. So as you heard this morning, the public can say in one poll, we want to cut taxes, we want to increase spending, right, we want to do all this at the same time. Polls don't give you what you need to, to take bold leadership steps because the public hasn't thought this through, they haven't had the time or the structure. So choice dialogues I'm going to spend some time on today are day-long sessions, about 40 people. They go way beyond polls and focus groups. And they're really important when the public's views are unresolved, when there are different perspectives and worldviews and belief sets. So they explore how people's minds change as they learn. Um, in focus groups and polls, you're really trying to avoid learning. I mean, it sometimes happens, but it is not your goal. We really want people to learn, and we want to see where they come out at the end of that day, once they've had the opportunity to really think. And again, where is the public willing to go, and where are they not? So we've done close to actually more than 15. We've done 15 dialogues with randomly selected representative samples of the public. We've done another eight or so where we brought members of the public together with top leaders around the country. And the framing of this discussion is not what should we do about the federal debt, because then what you get is people being angry, right, people being frustrated. What we ask them is what kind of country do you want to live in in 20 years? What kind of country do you want your children to live in in 20 years? And what should the federal government's role be in that country? And what we find in these discussions, and this is on all issues, is if the people are engaged in figuring out what it is they want, what sorts of policies make sense, what, sorts, what sort of future they want, then they're willing to make sacrifices, then they're willing to consider trade-offs. However, if they feel they are being sold, being spun, or being convinced of something, they are much less willing to take on those sacrifices, those trade-offs, the really hard choices. Um, so what we did um, ultimately is if, if you've defined a future you want, if you know what the role of the federal government is, are you willing to pay for it? This isn't just a visioning exercise. This is an exercise in hard choices. And we focused on four areas in particular, Medicare and Social Security, defense spending, other federal activities, which we lumped together, and taxes and debt. Now, this may not shock you, but it is critical, and I think we cannot overstate how important this was. The main obstacle, and this is across the board in every part of the country, to public support for hard choices, was not that people don't want to spend any more money, was not that people weren't willing to consider spending uh, cuts. It is that they were incredibly mistrustful. They felt, you know, uh, we were talking about stewardship at lunch, that that had been completely given up on, that the government was no longer the steward of their best interests, that they could not trust where their money was going, they did not trust that it was in their best interest, they did not trust their leaders. This is deeply felt, it has only increased. We talk about there being three great periods of mistrust in this country. We are at the height of one of those three, the Depression, Vietnam, and right now. So people are willing to make trade-offs, and this includes benefit cuts and tax increases, but only if they can be assured that their money is being spent well and for the purposes intended. 
Now, this means they want more out of their leaders. It doesn't seem that way when you watch TV or listen to the radio or you read the Internet sometimes today. But in fact, what we found with randomly selected people is they want to be told the truth. They want to know the pros and cons. They want to know the implications of these choices. Right? We talked earlier about a flat tax. Somebody brought up a flat tax. Well, Bob Bixby then said, well, what are the implications? How, what are the pros and cons? What does that look like 10 years down the road? People are ready and willing to have those conversations. Uh, and leaders... Need, they want their leaders to take them there. So what was common ground? This was common ground. This is, we did these before and after the economic crisis. And it was common ground at the end of eight hours, not in the morning. Okay? The national debt must be stabilized, must be stabilized if we are to have a future, and if possible, reduced. Now, this is a concept we talk about a lot, the learning curve. And the learning curve is something that our founder, Dan Yankelovich, has written about, has talked about. Um, and it's really how people come to judgment on complex, emotional, value-laden issues. This is not what happens on issues where there's a technical solution. A lot of times people say, if only the public were more educated, right? So I think we have evidence now that education does not buy consensus and does not lead us to a solution. If that were true, the very well-educated experts you see on these panels today would all agree, right? The answer would be clear because it's just about information. It's not. It's about worldviews. It's about beliefs. It's about values, as David Walker said. So how do you get through this learning curve on a complex issue? And a learning curve issue has a couple of characteristics. One, people haven't taken in the implications of the solutions they're talking about. Two, you've got a time gap problem. Right? It takes a long time to move it along the learning curve, but we don't have 20 years for people to figure this out. We've got to make decisions now. So how do we accelerate the learning curve? Choice dialogues accelerate the learning curve. So you start with raising awareness. That's happening now. The debt, our f fiscal issues, are at a much higher level of salience in the public than they used to be. But then you've got to work it through. And working through is where you get past denial, and even more important, wishful thinking. And wishful thinking is huge. If we eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse, we got enough money for everything, right? It's wishful thinking. If we get rid of the space program, oh, and foreign aid, those two things, we should be just fine. Their wishful thinking is all over the place. Um, we take people through that, and they get themselves past it. So at the end of the day, they really had worked through some things, some things they had gotten some of the way towards. And what's most important is they're really willing to engage on these issues. First, shifting focus in end-of-life care. People did not realize how much we were spending on end-of-life care. It's huge. And they realized we had to change. They realized America needs a national conversation about end-of-life care. Evidence-based medicine. You heard David Walker talking about that. A lot of questions people have. Who makes the decision? Who sits in judgment? Can we trust the bureaucracy? However, they understood that Medicare would need something like this ultimately if it was to be sustainable. Rethinking defense policies and spending. Spending smarter, reducing defense spending. How exactly they didn't resolve. And increasing taxes. Now, there was agreement on this among liberals, conservatives, old and young, if we could guarantee the money was going towards what it was supposed to be going for. So there were conditions on that. They move farther on other things, reducing the debt absolutely agreed upon. Medicare and Social Security must remain universal, cannot be a welfare type program. They were not willing to rewrite the social contract to that extent. However, they agreed changes were needed, raising the cap on, on FICA taxes, uh, scaling Medicare premiums to income, some notion of scaling benefits and premiums, and focusing on prevention and wellness. They talked about needing a shift uh, overall health care reform, that just reforming Medicare without larger health care reform made no sense to these folks because you would never get the cost savings. And they talked about taxes, trust, and accountability. This was huge, and it's, it should be huge for all of us. Again, willing to take the steps to pay if accountability and trust is built in. So they really wanted to know where that money was going, not just how it was being spent, but what it was accomplishing, a more transparent tax system, stronger oversight, all the things you've heard the panels talking about all morning. The public came to those on their own after a day of discussion. Now, we just uh, did another round, and we expected that there would be some differences, given the fact that we've seen great economic turmoil, people are out of work, people are losing their health care, and we saw very little difference in some of the conclusions, which was surprising to us. There was significantly more anxiety about jobs and health care. There was significant focus on job creation, again, not surprising, green technology, climate, 
But the major conclusions in those four areas were almost identical. People really believed they had worked this through, um, and it wasn't situational, and they really uh, stuck with it. Um, and I would say that in surveys we did six months after the fact, uh, they stuck with these conclusions. They did not change their mind. With polls, they changed their mind depending on how you ask the question. This stuff sticks. And what we did find was that 70% of the people that participated in these dialogues started saving money after. So they changed their behavior, their personal behavior, by thinking about the system. So to conclude, there's some implications in this. One is that rebuilding trust, um, that's not a technical solution, but it is a critical precondition for public support on all of these difficult choices. Leaders must take steps to rebuild trust. And that means focusing on problem solving, not spin. And we didn't, uh, we didn't do that so well this summer in our town hall meetings. We didn't, we didn't really get to the problem solving, and we saw the results of what happens when you don't allow people to really engage. You've got to engage the public. You've got to change the expectations of leaders, be more honest. And I think the lesson we have learned is the public is ready to have this difficult conversation, and we have seen them do it over and over again. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Martin Cerna, and I'm one of the co-founders and the deputy executive director of, of an organization that uh, I really love called Concerned Youth of America. And so CYA, as we call it, is a student-run, nonpartisan, grassroots, 501c3, um, and fiscal responsibility, the deficit, the, the national debt, these are our issues. And I think after, you know, the hours that we spent here this morning, I think you can understand why I'm passionate about this issue and why I think it's so important. Um, I'd like to sort of tell the story of CYA and in doing so explain why I'm hopeful, why I think there, there's reason to, to be positive, um, having gone out into the country and interacting with young people both at the college level and the, the high school level, why I think there, there, there's reason to be hopeful. So we, uh, we were started by four or five high school students. We went to school together um, when I was a senior in high school. And, you know, we, we were all, you know, politically minded, but from totally different uh, you know, partisan political backgrounds. And we got together and we decided this was, you know, the issue for our generation. Not just an important issue, but, but the issue. That it'll determine, you know, our futures and, and have, you know, such significance for, for the future of our, our country. And we, we started off really small. We were in the, you know, our math classroom. Um, we had no money. We, you know, had no experience. We, I mean, this was a bare bone sort of for real startup. And I think we, we've come a long way. And uh, that's partly why, you know, I think there, there's, there's so much positive, um, positive news in, in, on this issue. Um, you know, we did an event with, with the treasurer of Massachusetts who is, you know, very knowledgeable about these issues, feels very strongly. Um, and, and then we, we, we went off to college. Um, you know, we spread out different campuses, and we were able to, you know, interact with people at our schools. We, you know, brought in other student leaders to join the team, um, if you will, uh, of people that were running CYA. And we, we started doing events on campuses. You know, small things, maybe one of us goes and, and talks to, you know, 12 people, 50 people, 100 people, 200 people about this issue and why it's so important. Now, I, I don't need to tell you guys because you've heard it from people that are far more knowledgeable than I am. But, it, you know, it was, a, it was really a privilege to go to different schools, to interact with people from, you know, very disparate backgrounds, uh, about an issue that that's relevant to all of us, you know, whether it was at you know a, a panel of professors at Harvard or it was just me in a classroom uh, in a high school in Oxford, Mississippi, we we really connect with people and seeing the interest and the positive feedback that that we get is really what what keeps us going, what, what keeps us committed to CYA. Because I think, I, I think a lot of the, you know, the people inside the Beltway would be surprised how many young people 
when you talk straight, when you when you don't patronize them, and you explain the issue in you know understandable terms. Um, people from different different political persuasions can b- all recognize um, how you know important this issue is, and that there are that this is a problem that that's not just you know for Republicans or or just for Democrats and. That's that's really the rewarding thing, and, and what makes me so hopeful is that we've been to so many different campuses, uh, different high schools, different classrooms, and pretty much everywhere we go, there there's there's a strong response. Whether it's you know after an assembly, there's you know a line of people afterwards, you know everyone's going to lunch, and, and there's 25 people there standing waiting to to talk to us and and you know find out more about CYA. And you know, ask what they can do and how they can help. And you know, they're so excited. Um, it, it's it's really a, a fantastic privilege to be able to to go and interact with all of those people. Um, we we've had the the great fortune to work closely with the Concord Coalition um, over the last few years, and we were featured uh, in IOUSA uh, in flattering, broad horizontal stripes. Me, you know, doing extremely embarrassing things, shouting at people as they walked through a, a college campus. Um, I hope for a more distinguished role in, in IOUSA too. But uh, you know, uh, our executive director Yoni Gruskin and and a few other members, uh, you know, were interviewed and, and spoke about you know why we care so much about this issue. And and you know, it, it's easy to to get angry and to be outraged about what's being done to our generation. And you know, CYA generally tries to 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 remain you know committed to intergenerational uh, solutions to this problem. We've We've uh, been lucky. Uh, Yoni's been on CNN, and you know we've had other members on uh, other cable channels just reaching out to young people to try and explain this issue. Um, obviously, the people that are here right now um, have a strong interest in public policy and um, you know a proclivity for these sorts of wonkish issues. You go into a, a captive audience high school in, you know, Iowa or something, and it's not quite the same. You know, you, you've, you've really got to uh, approach the issue I- using different language. And at the same time, I think students and young people of all backgrounds really respond to respect. And, and you, you know, being – they will rise to the occasion if you – Ask them to engage on on this issue and to to come to understand uh, you know some of the more specific details. Now CYA is a 501c3, so we uh, and we would never be able to agree uh, on specific policy decisions on our board because of different uh, different ideas of what's best for the country. So you know we're, we're not a uh, we're not lobbying or, or proposing super specific ideas. We're really focused on building a political space where politicians feel that doing the courageous thing, doing the right thing, is, is not politically inviolable. And I think that's, that's the great tragedy about this issue is that people uh, in Washington are convinced that if they do what they know is the responsible thing um, – if they do what what needs to be done, when you look at the numbers, when you look at, at the situation, they assume that that the political fallout will be enormous and that you know they'll never you know never never get reelected. And we're really committed to educating young people so that they will you know go out and they will vote for the the courageous politician. They will talk to their parents. They will talk to their classmates. Um, about why the, the politician that does the right thing is is a statesman and and a leader that you want to stay in office. Um, you know, I, I I think the 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 CYA sort of mission is is sometimes you know the the response is oh well you know what are we going to do what what you know what are are you know are you guys Drafting legislation? Are you, you know, convincing lawmakers of, of this position or, or whatever? You know, we get a lot of uh, questions about what to do next. And I think the 
most important thing is to is to go out and vote and and just to be aware of of how serious this issue is and and that each each individual just by you know when something co- pops up on CNN or on some other you know cable cable news station and and there's some soundbite about oh you know such and such person you know is cutting you know this program for your grandma or this such and such person is raising taxes they're a tax raiser they're a tax raiser to, if each of you when you're in that situation you know you're in the room you say well well wait a minute let's you know I mean we don't want to be, you know, in a situation where we're all taxed into poverty. But uh, there, are, there are trade-offs, and we can be mature about it. And I think the the most important thing is um, is reaching out to friends and family and colleagues and explaining why this issue uh, is so important and why the tough decisions have to be made. And uh, that that's really what what CYA is all about. Um, if people have questions, I can talk more about the specific. You know things that that we do um, that we've done, but uh, you know it, I I just I, I'd really like to emphasize we we've heard so much doom doom and gloom uh, about how horrible this situation is and how you know America is is careening on this horrible course. Um, having you know seen thousands of young people you know my own age that I can talk to about this issue, it's amazing how many people are sincerely interested and become quickly passionate about this when, they, when they're given the, uh, the, the reality and, and how, how serious the situation is. And, and my line is this is not a partisan issue. This is an American issue, something that, that all of us really need to address because our futures, um, our futures are on the line. And, and that's why you know, it's so important to reach out to young people and get them, get them involved in this issue. But uh, that, that's, that's all I have. So thank you very much. All right. Um, hi. Just get this. Um, I'm David Burstein. And um, let me, I'm going to tell you a little bit about 18 and 08, the organization I run. Um, which started with a film. So it started on election night 2004. I was sitting around with a bunch of my friends watching election results come in. And I started to think, you know, why is it that more young people didn't vote? And it was frustrating to me because I, I was someone who was very politically minded, very politically interested, as were many of my friends who were there with me that night. And I said, you know, this is this is our country. Why is it that more people aren't stepping up to the plate? And that and that's the I mean that's the basic thing, right? That's that's the basic reason why young people should vote because it's your country, and if you want something if you want something done, uh, and you want to have a say in decisions that are being made, you should vote. So. Um, in the wake of that election, I started thinking about, well, how can we change this for the next time around? What can we do for 2008 um, to sort of make a difference? And there have been a lot, there have been a lot of things that have been tried and, uh, to get young people involved. There are a lot of organizations that exist uh, to get young people registered to vote and involved. But very few of them are actually led by young people uh, in terms of, and by young, I mean people who are under like 22. I'm still, I turned 21 last week, so I'm still, I'm still there. Um, and I think that, that that to us was something that was really important, that this was a peer-led idea. And the second thing was to try and capitalize uh, on new media, and particularly film, and the power of film as a way of getting people involved. So I had the idea that I'd make a documentary about young voters and the youth vote and why young people should vote. So the initial idea was to do sort of a very small sort of project, go out and interview a couple of people who would be willing to talk to me, someone who had no film background, who what, I wasn't really associated with a production company or institution. I didn't, I'd never made a film before. I didn't even have a camera, um, didn't have a distributor lined up or anything like that. And I said... I think, and I I made this challenge, I said, I think that if I go around to politicians and say, you know, I'm a young person and young people want to talk to you, people will listen. And sure enough, they did. Uh, We shot 
over 150 hours of footage with people ranging from Richard Dreyfus, the actor, to um, Barbara Boxer, to John Kerry, to Jeb Bush, um, to uh, John McCain, a whole host of people uh, across the political spectrum uh, about you know what? What is it that what is it that young people are concerned about, and what can you do as a politician to get to reach out to young people better, and ultimately putting all these into into a narrative about why it's important for young people to vote. And, and it was interesting because we got some pretty phenomenal responses. There was one member of Congress who I interviewed um, who basically said that it was a mistake to lower the voting age uh, to 18, and that young people haven't taken advantage of the opportunity that was given to them, um, which was, I disagree with, but it was really eye-opening thought and perspective from a member of Congress. And I think that that represented the way a lot of members of Congress, at least in the time I started filming in 2004 and 2005, felt about young people. That we're here, you know, we're available, um, and, you know, we're not hearing from young people. And we're not, they're not voting, they're not coming to our offices. Um, so I think they were really, they were interested and excited, and I think that's part of the reason I got so many people to participate in the film. And um, that in and of itself I viewed as somewhat of a success because I felt that if nothing else, I'd made politicians think for 10 minutes, 30 minutes, however long the interview was, about young people and their perspective. So then we finally put the film together in 2007, um, and we're very lucky to sort of get an initial buzz around it, including a piece on the ABC Evening News. Um, and it launched into a not-for-profit organization, also called 18 and 08, um, that used the film as its centerpiece to go out and register young people to vote and get people involved in a dialogue about polit politics and policy. So we're targeting... 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds, 22 year olds, people who are first time voters, new participants in politics, which is where the 18 uh, comes from. So, and we took the film all around the country. We did a thousand events during the election cycle. We registered 25,000 voters. We did a PSA series with Maggie Gyllenhaal and Hill Harper, Peter Sarsgaard, Olivia Wilde that was with MySpace. Um, we did candidate forums with congressional candidates specifically addressing youth issues. Um, and we went to high schools. We were in curriculum in about 35 states, including the entire New York City Public School and Los Angeles County School District. Uh, bought copies of the film for every school. And we wanted to have a multi-pronged approach. Um, because I think a lot of times when people think about targeting young people on an issue, and this is certainly true of fiscal issues, um, is people try and target either people who don't, who don't care at all or who don't know at all, or they try and target people who are already activists. Um, and there's a very different approach, obviously, for targeting both of those people. And we tried to do everything. I mean, we had a partnership with uh, gaming stores where they were running content from our film in their stores. Um, and we did panels with uh, a group called Elder Hostel, which I don't know if you know, but it's the senior center programming um, facility where we did intergenerational panels encouraging grandparents to talk to their grandchildren um, about why it's important to participate and vote. Um, so we did a lot of different things, trying different every way possible to reach young people through people who influence them as well as all different types of young people. So... We did that, and guess what? Young people voted, and that was pretty exciting. Um, and, I mean, we had one of the largest turnouts of young people in an election um, in quite some time. So a lot of people in the youth community, and there were a lot of groups that worked on this, uh, saw this as a big, a big victory. Um, now, let me tell you, talk to you a little bit about, since we are in Denver, the last time I was here, which was for the Democratic Convention, which is uh, a little over a year ago and we're coming up on the one-year anniversary of the election. One of the things that I think the election accomplished for young people was a great appreciation by people in the media, by many politicians, and by the public at large that young people are active. 
at least when it comes to voting, and that young people are taking their role as participants in politics seriously. And that is a huge, huge victory. I mean, to hear on election night, I mean, contrasting with 2004, when young people actually increased their turnout by 11% in 2004 over the previous election. Um, and to hear Brian Williams on NBC be like, well, you know, the young people, they just really didn't turn out. It's so disappointing. And then to contrast that with 2008, where everybody across the board was saying, this is the young people, like, yay. So that was pretty, that was, that was definitely, I think, um, a, a wake-up call for young people that, hey, if you go out and you get involved, people will recognize it. Um, and that is something that is that's definitely not lost. Um, so, but what has, but what has not happened is while there have been a couple victories for young people in ter legislatively and politically, um, there have been, there's been a great, um, sort of disinterest or, or ignoring of young people when it comes to fiscal issues. Uh, and when it comes to the fact that this can is basically continuing to be kicked down the road, um, at the expense of this generation. And one of the things that we did when we go out, when we went out and did all these events, was we, we did, I think we did more than, than raise awareness. Uh, and that was one of the things on Heidi's nice little curve up there, um, which is that there's, there's a real, there's, I can't emphasize enough the, the, the importance of raising awareness, but c also coupling that with committing people to a specific action. In our case, it was asking people to register to vote. Now, that's not the end game, and that's not all we wanted people to do. But we felt if we draw people into a way, to a form in which they can see our film, which, by the way, you can view on our website, agnight.com, if you are so inclined. Um, and you draw people in, you have them have a common experience, you have them have a discussion, and then you ask them to register to vote. And so giving people a concrete action to do makes them start thinking about other things and other ways they can be involved. Um, because when you just sort of give people a pitch, give people a speech about this is the crisis, it's, you know, it's terrible, and you, you, there has to be, you have to ask people for something directly. And that's a, that's a starting point. Because all these issues are incredibly overwhelming, not just to young people, but to anyone. Um, and in terms of the economic crisis right now, I, I was looking at jobs numbers the other day uh, for a piece I was writing for the Huffington Post about where young people are. Um, and it's the worst unemployment numbers for young people since, I think, the early 80s. Um, we've got this huge debt that we're going to, that we're sort of responsible for at the moment, I guess. And we've got... Um, College, college tuition rates out of control. We've got an education system that's failing us. So in general, not doesn't really look very pretty for young people at the moment. Uh, a lot of challenges, but I think the exciting, the really exciting thing to me is having traveled all over the country. We went to 35 states um, and did events. There's this, um, if ever there was a generation who was willing to and and ready and able uh, to take on the challenge uh, that, that that were that has been handed to us. It's this generation. Um, so I think it's a really exciting time to be young, and we're starting to gain a lot of power, uh, particularly in politics. Um, young activists are really on the rise. I mean, if you think about 20 years ago, young people, the idea of starting your own organization, starting your own business, was just not something. 20, 30 years ago that was really on the radar screen for young people. So this is an exciting and powerful time to be young, and we're gaining power and momentum among adults and politicians. And let me just leave you with one, one quick story to illustrate that. Um, I have a good friend named Matt Siegel, and uh, Matt runs an organization called the Student Association for Voter Empowerment, called, also known as SAVE. And Matt was a student at Kenyon in 2004, um, uh, which is in Ohio, during the elections. And he stood on a four-hour line of mostly college students waiting to vote. So he was, uh, he, he voted, but he was, he was frustrated by that. He didn't think that was right. Um, so from that, instead of 
deciding, you know, sort of storm the gates, like protest. Um, Matt decided to set up a organization, a not-for-profit, uh, that would do, that would lobby Congress and work with members of Congress um, to try and increase voter access. And Matt, Matt now graduated and he lives in Washington. Um, and I have to say that he has achieved a tremendous amount of, of progress by being one of a very, very small number of young people who regularly go to Capitol Hill to talk to members of Congress, who, who understands the value of working with politicians and is willing to extend that hand uh, and work with them. And he has, he has a bill that's actually going through markup right now that he's basically responsible for called the Student Voter Act, which is going to um, make college campuses um, have to do a lot more proactive work to encourage, uh, incur encourage their students to register to vote if they so choose. Anyways, so I think that that's a good example of what, what young people can do if they, if, they, if they try and put their mind to it. And if we're willing to extend that arm to politicians and go and talk to them, um, because that's that's where this problem is gonna is going to be solved. I mean, it takes courageous politicians, but it takes young people, the power of young people, the power of youth, going and speaking to people and telling them this is our future. I mean, no, I, I don't think that most of the people here are fiscal experts. Um, I'm certainly not, and but I, I am an expert in wanting to have a good future for myself and my generation. And I, that's something that matters a lot to me. And so I think that that personal experience that we have um, is, is one of the most valuable tools that we do have. So I would encourage you all to, uh, to go out and, and uh, take that challenge and use the power that we have as young people. Thanks very much. Hi there. My name is Patrick Creed, and I'm a documentary filmmaker. I, I made a film called IOUSA. I also made a movie called Wordplay, which was about crossword puzzles. I know. I pick bad topics. It's OK. <laughs> um, but uh, my wife and I work together. We've, we've, uh, our, both of our films have premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, and they were released uh, nationwide in theaters around the country and uh, have won lots of awards and stuff. And we're, we're very fortunate to, to have had that track record so far. I want to speak very briefly on a very important topic to me and I think to you as well. How many of you are reporters, either at a school paper or have ever been a photographer or, okay, I see one hand, it's okay. Okay, we got another one, we got a couple, okay. So you know as reporters how hard it can be to tell a good story, especially a challenging story. I would argue that you are all reporters in one in one sense, that you're all going to go back home to your roommates or your parents or your, your friends uh, later on today and tell them about what you did today. I think as, as a whole group, we need to be better at storytelling. We need to find the stories that matter, and we need to tell them better. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my experience with IOUSA. We started making this film in November of 2006. And a lot of my colleagues said to me, let me get this straight. You're making a movie about the national debt. That's the worst idea I've ever heard in my life. I heard that from three different friends of mine who are in the film business. Uh, at the time, if you recall, everyone was talking about the Iraq War. And rightly so. It was a very big story. It still is today. No one was talking about the national debt. Uh, but we felt it was a good story, and we felt that as time went on, the story in the country would not be so much about the wars we were fighting uh, and the challenges that we faced as a country, but how we were going to pay for all those things. Within a year, the film was done. It was accepted to the Sundance Film Festival. It went there. Later on, was distributed around the country and uh, became one of the... Uh, most critically acclaimed films of the year. And um, it was seen in, in theaters all around the country. I know a lot of you have seen it. Um, on our way to an awards show in January of 2009, we went to the Critics' Choice Awards. We were nominated for Best Documentary. 
we had a meeting with a very interesting person named Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks bought the rights to IOUSA. He now owns them. He's going to try to make that documentary into a narrative film, kind of like he did with the movie John Adams, if any of you have seen that. He also did that with a book called Band of Brothers, which was on HBO, which was an excellent film. Um, he did that to some extent with the movie Saving Private Ryan. He starred in that film, but he was also one of the producers of that film. I asked Tom at our meeting, I said, so let me get this straight. You want to make a movie about the national debt. That's a terrible idea. And he kind of laughed because he, know, he knew that I had heard that too. Um, but I asked him sort of what he wanted to do, like if he wanted to just kind of create a new story or, or what it was that he wanted to do if he, if he were to make this film someday. And he said, I'm just going to take your documentary, and I'm going to use that as the story, and I'm going to cast it with different people playing different characters in the film, and I think it's a great story. I think everyone should see this story. And I said, well, okay, let me ask you this. Now, how many of you have seen IOUSA? Okay, so the two stars of the film are David Walker and Bob Bixby, who have both spoken here today. So I said, to, I said to Tom Hanks, so who do you think would play Dave Walker in this movie? And he said, um, he said I, I've actually, I have some ideas. I don't know for sure yet. But my thought is it needs to be a really dynamic actor and a really good actor, and I, I think Paul Giamatti would be excellent. He, Paul Giamatti played John Adams, and he won an Emmy, and he's an, he's an amazing actor, and he'd be great. So I said, okay, I could see that. Who would play Bob Bixby? And he said, me. I said, so you're going to play Bob Bixby? And he said, yeah. I mean, I think it'd be great. So it's going to be Paul Giamatti and me traveling in a van around the country telling people about the national debt. I said, okay, that sounds, I could see that. That could be really cool. So whether or not this film gets made or not, it, it may or may not, even if you're Tom Hanks, this is a tough sell for a story and a tough sell for a film. But the point is this, as storytellers, if you find a story that you believe in and you, a story that you think matters, the first thing you have to do is stick to your guns. Don't let anyone talk you out of a bad, what you think is a good idea. Don't let anyone tell you that it's a bad idea. The second thing is get your facts straight. If you're doing a story that's nonfiction, stick to the facts. There's a lot of highly paid professional journalists these days who are very bad at reporting stories and getting the facts straight. And I would strongly encourage you to stick to the facts. And the last thing I would encourage, most of all, is you've got to make people care. If they don't care about the story you're telling, then you're not telling it well enough. And you have to go back and figure out how to tell it better. That's your job as storytellers. That's your job as citizens. When you leave this, con this conference today, to go home and tell people what, this, what happened today and why it was important and why they should care. We live in a democracy. That's the only way things change in this country. And I think the best hope for this story to get traction is for you to go back and tell people about what this story is and why it matters. Am I being idealistic? I don't think so. After Pearl Harbor was bombed, FDR went on the radio and he told the country that this was a day that will live on in inf infamy and that we have to change as a country and, and we have to get involved in this war, which we did, and we went on to win the war, and it changed the world forever. 20 years later, John F. Kennedy said, we are going to put a man on the moon. And that happened by the end of the decade. And a little over five years ago, a former vice president was traveling around the world telling people about a climate change. And he and a friend of mine named Davis Guggenheim, someone I know uh, through, through the documentary world, told a story called An Inconvenient Truth. That movie, that 90-minute film, changed the conversation about climate change forever. It's up to all of us, not just as citizens, but as storytellers, to find the stories that matter and to tell them well. And uh, I hope we figure out a way to do that. I want to leave you with one final thought. Right after 
FDR was elected in 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, he was elected during the grips of the Great Depression, and one of the things that he campaigned on was something called Social Security. He said that this country needs a Social Security plan, and that when I get elected, we're going to have that. So shortly after he was elected, he was walking down the street, and a little old woman walked up to him and said, Mr. President, you promised me Social Security. When are you going to give it to me? And he turned to her and he said, I'm not going to give it to you. I'm going to make you. You're, excuse me. I'm not going to give it to you. You're going to have to make me give it to you. I think that's a very, very important lesson in a democracy. If you want us to get traction on this issue of the national debt, if you want this situation to get better for you and for your kids, you have to make our elected officials make it better for you folks. It's not going to happen otherwise. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, panelists. Uh, we have some incredibly valuable time coming up here because I think at the end of what has been uh, a fascinating day, uh, it's time to hear about some of your concerns, some of your passions, some of your thoughts. Uh, let, me, let me just kick us off before we turn to our, our student panel with a couple of uh, remarks. One very contemporary that uh, was delivered this last weekend by Senator uh, Judd Gregg of uh, New Hampshire on uh, one of the CNN shows. And he, he said the following, and this is a United States senator. Interestingly enough, he's not running for uh, re-election as I understand it. But these were his remarks. They were fairly widely reported uh, in the press. You talk about systemic risk. The systemic risk today is the Congress of the United States. Uh, he said, we're creating these massive debts that we're passing on to our children. We're going to undermine fundamentally the quality of life for our children by doing this. Um, and he went on to say the following. He said, the figures mean that we're basically on a path, and this is what was so widely reported in the press, we're on the path to a banana republic type of fiscal situation. Think of the implications of this. The United States of America on the path to becoming a banana republic. And you can't do that. You can't keep running these federal programs out into the future and not paying for them. And you can't keep throwing debt on top of debt. Right? So one of the lessons, it seems to me, that, that we want your reactions to and your thoughts about is the reality that our country is at risk. Things look extremely normal, don't they, right? People go about their business. Uh, we've had a massive recession, true. We've had an implosion of the financial system to a certain extent, and yet life goes on. We don't see rioting in the street. We don't see uh, massive social dislocation yet, yet. Let me leave you with one final thought, and then we'll turn to our panel from rather obscure 18th century Scottish historian Alexander Teitler. And I think it's very telling about what is really at risk, because what is at risk is our democracy. This is what Teitler said. A democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. Think of that. Cannot exist as a permanent form of government. We assume since 1789, here it is. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse from the federal treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most benefits from the public treasury with the result that democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy, always followed by what? A dictatorship. Panelists, the floor is, is yours. If you would come forward and uh, grab one of the, the microphones, uh, we, will, uh, we will go forward. Jennifer, would you like to, would you like to be first? That would be great. And again, I think a uh, short statement and then uh, some, some thoughts for the panel, and they will, they will react. Um, well, first I wanted to thank you guys so much for coming to DU. Um, 
I think what you guys do exceptionally well is, of course, making fiscal policy accessible and compelling to young people. Um, I'm pretty sure that 99% of the people, young people in this audience under the age of 25 didn't wake up yesterday saying, yeah, fiscal policy, I need to do something about that. But what you've done, again, is you've made it compelling um, and something that is an urgent and pressing need. The challenge for me and what I'd love to get your insight on is the fact that I feel like it's a lot easier for me to mobilize my peers around the issue of policy issues like entitlement programs being issues of inter intergenerational warfare as opposed to intergenerational collaboration. So how do we shift that um, sort of thinking and how do we mobilize students instead around something more productive? That's a great question. I'll, I'll take a first stab at that. Um, I, that's, that's a really huge issue, and I think that a lot of a lot of this does look like that. It does look like you know the young versus the old. And there are a lot of people out there, to be perfectly honest, who are who are hoping for that um, because that's a way of not getting things accomplished. Because particularly in in this polis, um, the uh, Seniors are incredibly reliable voters, um, and and their perspective will tend to be deferred to. So that so we sort of probably lose in, in an intergenerational warfare situation. Um, the way to that at least I found to to avoid that is if 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 is really like coalition building. I mean the AARP of of all people, um, the guy who actually ran Barack Obama's youth vote program in Iowa, a guy named Hans Riemer, who used to run uh, Rock the Vote, who's a good friend of mine, um, is now working at the AARP. Um, and I, I said, like, Hans, why are, you, why, why are you doing that? And he says, you know, because there's a, there's, there's a lot that we can learn from each other. Um, so, and I think also the thing, too, so, so talking to older people and building coalitions, if you, you know, if, if a young person and an old person stand together, and we haven't seen a lot of this, frankly, and I don't think it would be that hard to do, um, stand together and say, you know, here, here's what we, we, we believe together, you know, I think that creates a really, a really good precedent. Um, and it's not that hard to do. I mean, get your own grandparents. I mean, I think that um, that's that's uh, that's a particularly powerful image of you know of, of of who the future is and talking to people about that. So I, w I would suggest, in terms of coalition building, um, and also trying to find and, and that part of that is trying to find common ground and where principles agree. Because obviously, you're not going to get um, everybody to agree on all. All principles, but there is a lot of common ground that people are not not working on as much in, between generations. Uh, I, I don't think a lot of young people view it as intergenerational warfare. I think there's a, there's a media perception, an image that's been put out there that there is this. I don't know of any young people who are in favor of intergenerational warfare. So, I, I would also suggest in our in our dialogues, we made sure that we had 18 year olds and we had 75 year olds. And we looked throughout the day at how they were changing. And what happens is you find people come in. First of all, the youngest people in the room came in pretty fatalistic about the future of Medicare and Social Security. I mean, most of them kind of weren't thinking about it much because they pretty much assumed it wouldn't be there, certainly not in the form that it is now. By the end of the day, they had 74-year-olds saying, this isn't about me, this is about you, and doing exactly what you talk about, looking for that common ground and identifying common ground. And, you know, I, I actually brought, I, I looked back at our data and found where were there significant differences. And one of the things we found that younger people were less likely to support measures that seem to harm seniors. That, in fact, they're what develops through dialogue, and I think it's much harder to do this when you only have young people talking to young people and old people talking to old people. Um, and I place myself somewhere in the middle of that at this point. But what, what you don't get is that sense of the commons. And so people, you know, you talk about how do you make this relevant and urgent. It's not just how do you make it relevant and urgent to me and to my life and my family. How do you create a sense of the commons? And you can do that if you have intergenerational ways of talking about these things and, and a really constructive search for that common ground. And then there are things that people will disagree about, and that's really important, and you understand that. But if you map out that common ground first, you have a platform to build on, which is very powerful. Yeah. Thanks. I would also like to just add that 
I, something that I always go back to as far as how do you prevent this intergenerational war that David points out we would lose um, is that most people are part of a family of some sort that includes people of multiple generations. So, I, I mean, and I think Joe Minerick pointed out earlier that, you know, it, perhaps I don't want my tax rate to be higher, but at the same time, if my grandparents are not sufficiently covered by Medicare, then, you know, my parents and, you know, someday, you know, me and the cousins will, will have to support, you know, an older generation. And parents sacrifice so much for their children for so many years to raise them that, you know, they, they care about their children's future. And if, if you frame it that way, that, that, you know, this is something that's important for your children and your grandchildren and, you know, Two, at least two of the presenters had, you know, little cute pictures of, of uh, you know, their grandchildren. Then it becomes a, a, a personal, you know, relationship, um, understandable sacrifice from both ends of the generational spectrum, and, and you know, dialogue is possible. Brian Stavka. I think you guys touched a lot on uh, what my question was, but uh, you know, I thank you for that. But um. Uh, three general understandings. First of all, I think that we all understand that to fix everything that we've heard about today, it's going to require uh, a certain amount of sacrifice. And then B, I think we understand that the groups of like-minded people generally fight for their own interests. Uh, that was evidenced by what I've heard today a, a number of times, the future that we want for ourselves. Now, the question that I have is, as we create this new group of like-minded people, are we suggesting that we ought to fight for our interests, or are we suggesting that we ought to sacrifice our interests for those that came before us and those that will come after us? Uh, the two, I guess it's a two-part question. Is that what you guys in your organizations are proposing? And B, in your interactions with the youth of America, regardless of age, is that what you are seeing? Are you seeing a sense of self-sacrifice, or are you seeing um, the fighting for our future, our future, as opposed to those of our parents? I would, just, I would kind of look at that. Um, that's a good question, and I would about you know, are we fighting for our issues or are we fighting for someone else's issues? I think if you look at this problem and you look down the road, it's easy to understand this is all of our problems and we are all going to suffer because of it. So it is in all of our best interests to address it and to fix it. Now, who's going to sacrifice a little more than his neighbor or her neighbor or, or, or vice versa? There's no way to get that perfect. There just isn't, there, it's impossible. But, again, this kind of goes back to what I was saying before about how if there is a compelling story and it's a story that we should all care about, which I believe the story is, if it is told properly and honestly, you cannot deny the fact that we are all going to suffer because of it. And then we just work our way backwards towards what some various solutions might look like. I, I mean that's that's right on, and I, I think just just to add to that, um, you know, people always ask me like, oh, what are what are what are the youth issues? Like, what are the big youth issues? And they are really the same issues. I mean, if you look at any polling or you talk to people, um, it's really the same issues that all people are concerned about. Um, and I think that this generation of young people um, is particularly particularly focused on trying to leave the world better than they found it. Um, and I, I, I hope that everybody here in the audience shares that idea. Um, if you don't, come back to me, and I'd love to know why not. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's, that's been uh, something that has been this sort of thing that's been like floating around that people think they're supposed to do, but people haven't been as focused on that. I think this issue is, is a good example of that. Um, and I think leaving the world better than you found it implies self-sacrifice, making it better for your generation and making it better for future generations and other generations at the same time. So I think it's I think I don't I don't think they're they're different things. I think they're all sort of wrapped up in the same thing. If you make if you make things better 
for someone, you're impacting other people as well. Thanks. Gabby Reed? I think it's easy for people to come away from a summit like this excited about trying to transform fiscal policy. And they feel the urgency right now. But we're going to go home tonight. We're going to go about our lives tomorrow. And maybe that sense of urgency will kind of fall away from us as we go about our everyday lives. How do we keep the motivation going for people? How do we get them on a day-to-day -day level? How do we make them feel the urgency every day so that every day they are talking to their public officials, telling them what they want, demanding, like you were saying before, that this is solved? How do we go about doing that? Um, I, I would say that the one thing that hopefully you will all take with you today is that um, even though you don't have control over the federal books and the federal budget, you do have control over your own budget and your own personal finances. And if nothing else, when you leave today, you should invest a little bit of time and a little bit of organization to get a sense of what your own personal finances look like. Uh, because, um, you know, that's probably going to have a more profound effect on your own personal life than whatever happens in Washington. I mean, I guess you could debate that. But um, And uh, as to the other one, the other one's harder, so I'm going to pass it over to my friend David. <laughs> um, in, terms of, in terms of every day, um, is it safe? Um, making people feel this stuff. Um, I'll just give you one cre concrete example, and I'll give a little get a, give a little plug to uh, the Peterson Foundation in doing this, um, which is that I just I, I discovered the other night that on Twitter, and I will talk for a minute about why you shouldn't rely too heavily on social media. Um, but what do, you, what do you call that? Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've heard of it, I don't. So um, there's you, the Peterson Foundation. You can go on their Twitter, and it like updates the national debt all the time. I think that going to what Patrick's talking about about uh, stories. That to me, and, and and I saw this when I was starting to make the film. We went through the halls of Congress, and there are these big posters. I don't know if you've ever seen them of like the national debt, and they like you know have like little things they tape over because it's like obviously always growing and changing. That is a really powerful statistic. I mean, and I mean, you don't have to like walk in every day and be like, "Hey, do you know what the national debt is today?" Um, but you know, reminding people of that on on somewhat basis and having that conversation, bringing it up among groups of people who you think might not might not talk about it, um, that's how it spreads. I mean, because I think that just reinforcing that in daily conversation is probably the at least on the base level, the most important thing you can do is if, if you want it to be, if you want people to think about it every day, talk about it every day. And, and, and it's, and the, I mean, it's hard when you, when you tell someone what the national debt is or, you know, what the situation is, it's hard for them to be like, oh, that's nice. I'm, I'm, I'm walking away. I mean, they've got to say something. I mean, one of the things you can do, we found there were a few pieces of information that could be conveyed in a slide or less that changed people's outlook, that let them think very differently. Just the stick figures, you know, of how many people used to be paying into every single person who's on Medicare or Social Security. So you have, you know, five happy workers and one sort of person as a recipient versus two people and one as a recipient. That image changed people's minds in a moment. And, ha and Concord Coalition has on their website oodles of these sorts of slides that if you had at your disposal, you really can, can convey a lot to people. Talk about storytelling. There are ways to tell the story. I also think demanding of leaders, and that's not just political leaders, that's civic leaders, right? Civic leaders have a role to play in this. The media has a role to play in this. Um, you know, if anything longer than a minute and 15 seconds on TV is, t is you know, too long, it makes it really difficult. So well, I used to work at a television station, and people would get up and demand that we tell the whole story, and, and then we would say to them, but if we have a story that runs more than a minute, you turn us off, right? So how do we choose our media? You know, what are we paying attention to? They're tracking everything we're watching, everything we're listening to. So choosing, requesting, writing letters to the editor, th these kinds of things, demanding the real pros and cons, the real implications of the kinds of things that, uh, it's really reacting to spin, reacting to being sold, and demanding something more in depth than that from our leaders, from our politicians, from our business owners, from anyone who sort of takes a position, continue to push to get the implications, to get the trade-offs, to really get people to focus on the long term. 
And we can do that all the time. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly add, uh, you know, how do you stay excited after you leave? Uh, Something that I find, uh, if you just stop and think about all of the little things in your life on a day-to-day basis where the federal government, the state government, and, you know, county or local government have their tentacles in, when you stop and think about how many facets of your life rely on government funding or, you know, when you get your paycheck, take a look at, at the payroll taxes. There are so many day-to-day, there's, there's so much day-to-day impact from these sort of fiscal issues, whether, you know, you're driving on an interstate highway or, you know, you're, you're being, you know, rescued by the fire department. The government is playing a role in your life all the time. And I, and I don't think people, you know, there's the famous get, you know, uh, you know, get government out of my Medicare. You know, people don't fully grasp how involved government is in their day-to-day life. And if you if you really internalize that and and talk to the people around you about that, I think at least for me that that's what keeps this issue relevant and and keeps it from being you know a purely intellectual exercise. I, I also just want to add on the excitement issue that I think the most exciting thing is that we can do something about it. I mean, we're in a, I mean, that's pretty exciting that this is a huge problem and we could play a big role in doing something about it. So I think that that's a, an exciting thought to think about. I just really quickly, we surveyed people a year after, six months after we did these dialogues, and we found that something like 75% of them had talked to 10 or more people about what they had learned. So, you know, those everyday casual conversations go very, very far if you're armed with good storytelling, I think. I uh, certainly want to invite, as we uh, go through our, our panel, many of you may have some questions as well, and uh, urge you to uh, join the, the line on uh, either side, and we'll keep fielding uh, questions until we run completely out of, uh, out of energy. So, uh, 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 Eric, you're up. Question, Eric Butts. My question is about the role of business in fiscal reform and the uh, discussion. Um, my question is, Do you perceive the business community as being a positive or a negative force uh, in this discussion? And what do you wish, what would you like to see out of the business community in the ideal world, or what would would be a good? Yeah, I I think the the role of of business, uh, as it were, I I, I feel like it's it's a little it's a little schizophrenic. There's there's always the the uh, you know we need to cut corporate tax rates and and all these you know intricate things that uh, you know having worked in in a in the Massachusetts State House you realize how dependent so many businessmen are on their little tax cut here and their little waiver there and their program there contract over here and sort of this this attitude of extracting value from the government. But, uh, you know, on the other hand, there are plenty of business leaders and communities of, of folks in that world that, that are leaders and that recognize, you know, whether, uh, you know, there's, there's been great corporate leadership on, on, for example, STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, um, and how urgent some of these issues are uh, for young people. And they recognize how, you know, inextricably linked the fate of the the federal government's fiscal health is, and the fate of all of these corporations that you know rely on consumption and innovation, and uh, you know you know they have to hire people, um, and and they recognize that they are a major stakeholder. I, I think there's there's a real mix of uh, as far as the leadership from the business community. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I was. The founder of our company just wrote a book called Profit with Honor, and it really talked about the shift in, in this is by Dan Yankelovich, and, and the shift in, in business stewardship ethics over the past 50, 75 years in this country, and the need for a real shift. You know, when we talk about mistrust in government, that extends to corporate America as well, and that has really changed, and it used to be that people looked to corporate America. Yes, they wanted to make a profit, but yes, they also had the commons at uh, you know, Commons best interest at heart, and and people don't believe that anymore. So I think it would be nice to see business take a role as civic leaders once again, looking out for all of our best interests. But they've got some trust rebuilding to do as well, I think. I think also to add to that, um, 
uh, and I'm, I'm now Twittering this, by the way, for all of you following at home. Um, so don't listen. Just read the Twitter. Um, is, is that uh, I think that this generation um, should be encouraged to, to, when we start businesses, which hopefully is sooner rather than later, I mean, that's, that's something that is, is can be a real con- contributor to this. I was talking at, uh, at lunch with someone from Concord, and we were he was saying the idea that there are young people founding companies now who are going to be in business for um, longer than anyone in the history of business. I mean, you've got young people who are founding companies at 20 who, will, who could potentially be there for, you know, 50, 60 years, at, as a founder and of a company, so I think that that's something to think about, and the role that we have to play as we start those start new businesses, because we can take a total leadership on this issue, on climate change, on you know all these issues of business ethics and responsibility, and we can set different salaries and compensation packages um, than have been there before. So I think that that's also an exciting opportunity that we have to be to create new kinds of businesses that are more imbued with some of the stuff we were talking about, about you know, making the world a better place and trying to do something uh, you know, besides just making the most money possible. Thanks. Brooke? So to uh, continue on a theme that was done earlier, um, it seems like one of the really salient themes of the day was that these issues are complex, um, not so much in that they're hard to understand, but there really are no easy answers. And we've also talked about how the news media and our soundbite culture really did not facilitate meaningful discussion about the issues. And with the rise of new media, new social media, such as Twitter and YouTube and Facebook, it seems like it might be even more difficult to actually um, have these kind of meaningful discussions about how complex these issues actually are. So I'd like to get your opinion on whether there's a way to really disseminate this information easily without sacrificing... um, complexity and the hard choices that are really implicit in the decisions we have to make. I, I think on that, there are two, there are going to be two levels. I mean, I, I think that we should be careful when we think about social media, um, and I'm, I'm writing a book right now that has a lot to do, that has a big section on this, um, is, is to what level we're using it to have meaningful discussions. And I think that we've got to be cautious about that and the the quality of the conversation. Um, and I still there's there's I, you can't you you cannot lose the importance of face to face conversations. But you cannot deny the power of social media to blast things out to large numbers of people and get a get a, a stat a, a tagline out there and raise awareness and get people excited and reacting. So I think that it's you sort of have to run both on parallel tracks. I mean, I, I don't think the national you know debt or, or these fiscal issues are going to be solved on Twitter. Um, I, I think, but I think that that's definitely a new level to to have to to give information and to reach more people with basic information. Um, but it but we shouldn't substitute social media for having having actual conversation. We should look at it as a tool for advancing the the, the message we're trying to get out. Um, not as a substitute for, for, for that. And I think that's, that's really important because so many people are just like sort of shifting to this social media because it's this exciting, you know, Twitter's, oh, this is an exciting platform. I mean, some people are saying, like, we're not going to have websites anymore. We're just going to have Twitter accounts. And I think, that, I, think that's, I think that's dangerous to sort of leap there, um, especially since, you know, who knows? Maybe in three years, Twitter will be, will be gone. I mean, you know, I think that... Um, but we, we should take advantage of these tools because they're powerful in the number of people they can reach instantly. And that's something you don't want to lose. Yeah, I also wouldn't, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't necessarily agree that this problem is that complex. I mean, parts of it are. But you can, it's, very, it's really quite easy to look at where our national debt is today as a percentage of the size of our economy. That's a, that's a graphic called debt to GDP. It, it tracks all the way back to 1789, which was the beginning of our government. We never had as big a debt to GDP as we did during World War II, and for good, for good reason. We were fighting two world wars at the same time. 
um, we are heading down the road right now where we're going to be there pretty soon. You know, we're 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 heading toward a World War II situation, and we're not fighting two world wars by any stretch of the imagination. So it's not that complicated. We we are we are in we are involved in fiscal policy that makes no sense. And 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 what, like what I was going to say about components of it not being that difficult. I read last week there was a study. This is you're going to have to kind of. I, I found this to be really shocking. There was a study that came out that said that of all the babies born this year, half of them are going to live to be 100 years old. And we are dawdling hmm. about changing the formula to Social Security by one or two years. I mean, it's, it's kind of embarrassing, really. There are 435 members in the House and 100 members in the Senate. Is that right? Yes. And one president. They can't embrace Social Security change and get that done. I mean, that's like Dave Walker said, that's a layup, and we're not doing it. So I don't really agree that it's that complicated. It's just not – no one has the guts to do it. And in part, that's not just their fault. It's our fault. Because we, we fall prey to commercials uh, during election cycles that say, gee, Ned, I heard that Senator Jones is going to change my Social Security. I've been paying into that for 50 years, and he wants to take it away. No one is talking about taking away Social Security. In fact, no one's talking about changing the age limit on Social Security for any time within the next 10 to 20 years. And we can't even get that done. I mean, that's ridiculous. You know, that they, get, they, they deserve an F for not getting it done, and we deserve an F for not de demanding that they get it done. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to wholeheartedly agree with both what Patrick has to say about the complexity issue. I mean, it, it's pretty simple. You, you can't spend more than you make. And, uh, you know, I've been in, you know, a high school in inner-city Memphis, and the ninth graders there, they, they grasp that concept. Um, you know, you can, you can complexify anything uh, in the world of public policy, but it, it's, it's a pretty straightforward thing. And then as far as the, the social media, I, we have found uh, at CYA that this, this is the sort of issue that really takes a look in the eye, a handshake, a smile, and a conversation. You can't, I mean, Twitter is, is the ultimate soundbite. Um, status updates are, you know, the soundbite of your life. Um, and this is the sort of issue where, you know, uh, to, to avoid sort of vitriolic polarization, um, you, you've got to sit down with people, you've got to work with, through these issues um, to help them grasp, uh, you know, how significant the problem is and, and what needs to be done to solve it. And, you know, David's right that, that you know, Facebook and Twitter and, you know, Dig and, and whatever, um, they're, they're, they're tools. Uh, they're not, and, and it, if, if there's one thing, people always cite uh, the Obama campaign for using social media to activate all of these people at the grassroots level. Uh, the key is, is that they use it to activate people. Uh, they use it to get people in the same room because that human interaction is still, you know, what we thrive on, what we need uh, uh, to, to take an issue seriously and, and to fully understand it. If, if I might just also add that um, what the, the, there's a difference between what the experts need to do, and that is to understand the complexity, to understand how to implement complex technical situations, spend their lives doing that. But it is not realistic, nor is it necessary for the public to become experts in all these aspects of fiscal policy. Because if you have, I, you know, I have done these dialogues with rooms full of people who've spent the last 30 years on fiscal policy, and you know what? They disagree on the same stuff. Because those are questions of values and questions of priorities. And what kind of government do we want to have? What should the government provide? And am I willing to pay for that? And those are questions the public can weigh, weigh in without an econ degree. You, you don't need to know all of it. We usually spend about 25 minutes out of eight hours on background. And the rest of it is giving people choices and trade-offs and letting them talk. And by the end of the day, they think they get it. And they do.
Te teachable moment here for a second. So I just tried to distill. How's, how's the tweet going? Right? I just tried to distill this conversation into a tweet. So let me know if you think that this 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 is good. Fiscal crisis isn't that complicated. There's no punctuation. Um, it's just that no one is taking it on. Was that sort of your point? Was that? Did that summarize it? Yeah. Did the, the, See? Okay. So, but still, but still, I feel like I've done you know, everything that. <laughs> um, but unless, but see, I mean, so that was sort of his point. But at the same time, if you hadn't, if you hadn't had this conversation, you would have missed the actual point and and the and the lar and the larger point in the context. So I think that that's just a little teachable moment there, folks. Okay. Great. Civics class in high school would be good. <laughs> <laughs> Emma. Okay. Um, well, I just wanted to talk about all you guys have been mentioning, like through the focus groups and the one-on-one -on -one contact, the talking to people, getting people to really talk about what they value and what they think is important, and giving them the information in order to like have that discussion. I just want to ask, how do you think that this can be expanded to reach a more broad range of the United States? Because what I've been seeing is that like the focus groups, you guys, you've talked to about like 600 people in these groups. And you know, and and the CUIA has done a lot of things around the country. But how do you get to the people who aren't really like focused in on this issue, and it isn't like a priority in their life, and because they don't see how it, it impacts them, or for people from very low income areas where they're just not brought that information quite as easily. So how do you how do you get this out to a broad range of America to get that idea that it's not that complex, but we just need to make these decisions? Can I, I just? I would just give. The, there's two answers. We, the scale question is a critical question for everybody who does the kind of work we do. I mean, you know, it's great to talk to 600 people, which is, um, you know, a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money. So there, we think there are two ways to scale, and one is through the media, and that includes both new media and old media, and one is through leadership. And so the work that we do, um, it's wonderful that the people in the room get a lot out of it, and it builds social capital, and they end up being very engaged. But that's not why we do it. And that's not why people do polls. They don't do polls so that it will affect the people who are being polled. They do polls to give information to leaders. So our hope is that we do this work and that, first of all, the media will cover it in a, in a different sort of way by putting both the pros and cons out there, putting the trade-offs out there. Also so that leaders have, in some sense, the political cover to have the more difficult conversation, to understand that learning curve that I put out there. Right Here are the three facts people need to get before you can even talk about it. Here are the struggles that they have. Here are the roadblocks and how they work through them. So for viewpoint learning, if we can lay out that learning curve, then we can help leaders lead. I think it was um, was it uh, Roosevelt who said you always have to stay about two or three steps ahead of the public, not ten, right? Because then it's very hard for them to follow. But you can't be right where they are. So we're trying to figure out how do we give leaders the information to be a little bit ahead, and also how do you find ways for the media to pick this stuff up in a very different way than they're doing right now? IOUSA is a great way of of uh, you know getting this issue to a very wide audience, um, just to sort of throw that throw that one out there, that, that media, uh, you know, it appeals to people, it's interesting, and, and you can learn a lot from it. Um, yeah, I mean, just to, to amplify that, I mean, there's a reason that there are two filmmakers on this panel. I mean, I think that there's, there's a lot, a lot to be said for, for mass media forms and doing things that you wouldn't normally think of. I mean, the Obama campaign got, for instance, a lot of, I, I thought brilliant move to advertise like within Xboxes, um, and Rock the Vote did a same thing with gaming people where they were like there was a thing where they could they, there was a voter registration like option within like the the video game. So I think that like that's something to think about is like where like identify the communities where you're not reaching and say what 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 do people do there? I mean, what are people interested in there? And say and say like it may sound strange, but go for it and and make make a bizarre partnership. And chances are you'll find people who want to work with you on that. Yep, great. And I'll, I'll just add one last quick thing. Whether whether you see the IOUSA or or see um, the fiscal wake up tour or any of the speeches that were today or any any of this sort of um, conversation on this topic, I think you will be surprised that if you didn't know anything about this subject coming into it. Um, 
the next time you flip through the paper or you hear a story on NPR or you see a story on the news, John Stewart's riffing on it on his show or whatever, you will be surprised at how much more willing you are to listen to it now that you have a basic understanding of what the components are and how they interact with each other. And I know that firsthand. When I started making IOUSA, I did not know the difference between a deficit and a debt. Go ahead and laugh, public policy the, people. I didn't. I really didn't know that. I didn't. I thought that in the late 90s, the Clinton administration had eliminated the national debt. They had elimination. They had actually. Okay, you don't have to laugh that hard. Um, <laughs> they had eliminated the budget deficit. The national debt was still where it was. It was coming down slowly, but it wasn't coming down very quickly. I know more than I could ever tell now about that story because I've, I've spent two years with it. But it's a great story. And you will see this story every day in some capacity for the rest of your life. And now you know. And I, so I, I don't want you to leave today feeling totally hopeless because you're actually taking steps toward understanding it and, and letting other people, trying to help other people to understand it as well. We're going to, just really in the interest, I think, of, of both time and energy, we'll take maybe one more quick question. Did you have a quick question? And um, uh, we, will, uh, we will wrap things up. Please. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'll be really brief and kind of just preface this question uh, with an example. Um, I work for the American Cancer Society, and we have a grassroots organization that works on citizens-based lobbying. And um, we have recently worked on an issue trying to engage young people because it was very directly affecting young people, requiring uh, private health insurance to cover um, college students if they were to get sick with cancer or some other kind of um, um, major illness during college, um, preventing them from being dropped from their insurance. And we found that we got a lot of membership and people involved in this issue uh, that were young because they were able to, you know, they were affected by this potentially or their friends were. Um, and in doing that, these people are now a part of the much bigger conversation about health care reform on behalf of our organization. Um, so I guess my question is, we are talking about very big picture things here. And so is it a strategy to get people, young people, involved by using FIRST as a way of sort of pulling them in um, an issue that's a little bit smaller um, and more directly affecting them tomorrow um, to getting them to be a part of the conversation that's much bigger and going to affect them in 15 or 20 years? I think absolutely. I mean, I think you're. you're I said. I'm sorry. That's the thing. Wearing. Uh, I think absolutely. I mean, your story is a perfect example of that. I mean, that's a great example of a sort of an effective campaign, and that's sort of really what you want. So, I, I mean, but I think it's. But that's not. A, it's not. Sometimes that works, and sometimes you draw people in by the bigger issue. So I think you've got. I think you've got to do. I think you've got to do both. But that's. I mean, that's definitely an effective way. And I think more importantly, you don't necessarily lose anything. Or it's not. Or there's no, I think, philosophical problem with drawing them in with a, a smaller issue first. So I think that I think that's great. If it works, I mean, that's great. I, I actually wanted to just quickly touch on the the last question about lower income communities because that's something that that we've become very enthusiastic about because every time that we take a chance and go to a high school uh, where you know. Kids have an entirely different background uh, than mine, or you know, Yoni, or, or whoever else is on the board of CYA. It's been incredibly rewarding, and uh, and it, it, it's surprising how uh, what a positive reaction that you get. And I think it, is if you're willing to take that chance, if, if you're willing to go out of your comfort zone um, to communities that often don't get the attention they deserve. For example, young people, um, it, it can be very rewarding. As far as that question about this the specific issue one issue that resonates well with college students uh, as far as fiscal responsibility is anyone that goes to a public university understands the the travails of the state budget process i mean it, obviously no one here goes to uh, a, a university of california school but but those i mean there are incredible sacrifices being made throughout that system because they have not kept their, their fiscal house in order. And a, a lot of times that's a really compelling way to get people interested in this bigger issue of, of, uh, of fiscal responsibility in government because it has such an enormous impact, you know, from the, the dining plan to their tuition rates um, uh, on the life of a college student. 
And I would say people, you know, I, I sort of briefly talked about civics education in high school. And, and Kettering Foundation re recently published an article talking about the decline in voting rates and tied it to the decline in civics education. We have lots and lots of people who come into our sessions who really don't know how government impacts their lives, who say to us, well, government really has nothing to do with me. I hear, I can't tell you how often I hear this. And I think people, we have a generation of people who really do not understand the connection between government and the roads they're driving on and the schools they're going to and many of the sort of the functions of daily life. And I think we have a responsibility, you know, he was talking about K-12 education and thinking about how we educate our very young people to think about government and then these kinds of issues become issues that they connect to and they understand they have a say in, and a responsibility to think about. Well... Some thank yous are in order. First of all, panelists, thank you so much for an incredible uh, hour and a half. We appreciate it. Second, uh, our thanks on behalf of the University of Denver uh, go to the Concord Coalition, which is an incredible organization and has been our partner in what has turned out to be uh, a wonderful and uh, 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 intriguing day of learning that started uh, early this morning. Uh, many of you have been with us throughout the entire day and uh, heard uh, David Walker and many, many other fiscal experts. Uh, we're, going, we're very, very fortunate that tonight at 7 o'clock, uh, indefatigable as he is, David Walker is going to return to this very building to a sold-out audience uh, of uh, community members where he is going to uh, once again talk about uh, IO uh, USA. Uh, but I think really uh, my thanks go to uh, not just University of Denver students, because certainly there were students from other universities here. I think your seriousness of purpose, I think your seriousness of intent uh, is manifest uh, I had a thought, very, very quick thought, that one of the things that maybe uh, we should all do, and these are questions you should ask to people like myself who ply the academic trade, uh, we spent a lot of time when we were kids demanding relevancy from our professors, relevancy about the civil rights struggle, relevancy about the Vietnam War, relevancy about uh, the emerging environmental movement, et cetera, et cetera. And um, maybe under the banner, we can, we can uh, Twitter this, uh, uh, David, uh, maybe we should uh, have a little uh, movement where we basically say, ask your prof. Ask your prof in all of these expensive and lengthy and time-consuming courses that you take uh, whether the content of their course, in fact, does touch on uh, the survival of the nation and the fiscal integrity of the country and the future uh, of the people uh, that we're teaching. And it's a privilege to teach you. Uh, and I think that, quite frankly, uh, David Walker issued a challenge. He said, raise the bar. Uh, I think many of us, quite frankly, have to uh, uh, raise our game uh, and rise to uh, rise to this challenge. I'm going to leave you with two quick thoughts, one of which is something we should avoid. It's a thought from the famous uh, Roman historian Livy. And he said, we can endure neither our evils nor their cures. We don't want to be those people. Uh, but maybe as a goal, we should think about uh, Thomas Jefferson's first inaugural address, very, very famous words. Still one more thing, fellow citizens, a wise and frugal government which shall restrain men from injuring one another, shall leave them free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement, shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. This is the sum of good government. Thank you all. Appreciate it so much.